some of the things on the agenda for this morning. Uh, we're only going to have, from what I can see, a, a small window just for uh, general talk this morning, and that's in the first half hour of the program. Steve Millington expected to return. He had an appointment last Tuesday. He was not with us in the studio, but is expected here today between 8.30 and 9 o'clock. He is the chairman of the Twin Falls County Republican Party, and we'll likely talk about some of the, uh, well, the discussion may center on the uh, 88 Republicans who are seeking the nomination for president. It's not quite that high yet, but it, it appears we're, we're pretty close. Also, I believe Grant Loeb's is here. I believe this is the Tuesday once a month that he drops in. And if that be the case, we have some questions for him about Hillary Clinton's email server, because some of you may know that before he returned to Twin Falls and became a prosecutor, he had been working in a Senate office on Capitol Hill. So he knows the ways of Washington, but he also knows people who break the law and what you do with them. So we'll we'll get some uh, Q&A with him on that particular topic, as well as anything locally that's going on uh, that may be of interest. And you have an opportunity to telephone those two men this morning as well and, and share some thoughts with them while they're in the studio with us. But I wanted to start out just recapping an event that I attended last night. I went to the Taylor Building at the College of Southern Idaho. There was a meeting there at 7.30. Now, beforehand, there had been a meeting of the college's board of trustees who oversee this refugee resettlement program in this community. And they were going to actually have a vote, I'm told, in advance. They were going to have a vote on limiting the public's ability to speak and and share the public's thoughts on this resettlement program, which they were going to do a catch-all and say, well, we just have to get on with our meeting and They weren't going to reference that particular topic, but that's what it's about. It's about silencing the dissent in this community. They don't want to hear it anymore. But they decided to table that. So they sent it to a committee. A a board comprised of seven people has sent it to a committee for discussion, which might mean two of them. And then they'll come back and they'll have a later vote on it at another time. Impressive, isn't it? When you figure that the people who sit on this, uh, this board likely... How many people turn out for an election for a college board of trustees? Really, think about that. Well, you get a couple of neighbors, and you get your family members, and maybe a cousin or two, and you get elected. And likely, I would would gather that probably never more than 70 votes have been cast in any of those elections. On the other hand, if you have about 500 angry people in the community who've been coming out periodically to many of these meetings uh, that have been taking place at churches and other locations— they might be able to muster enough votes to actually turn you away. And I was telling this crowd at a later meeting last night at 7.30 in the same building, I was telling them, you know what? You may end up in charge of this board. Not only will you have a, a say on how this you could cancel the contract for the refugee resettlement program, number two, you'd be running the college. Can you imagine that? A group of conservative activists who would actually be running an institution, an institute of higher learning in this country, that would be um, unheard of, at least in the last 50 or 60 years. So there is a lot going on in that situation. Now, I was told at the early meeting, they had handpicked a number of people to come in and actually speak in support of the refugee resettlement program, including a retired professor, uh, one of the uh, fellows you know who walks around in the tweed jackets with the patches on the elbows and quotes Karl Marx. And the guy came in and said, refugee resettlement has been a wonderful thing because he gets to eat a lot of unique and interesting foods. That's the man's argument in support of the refugee resettlement program. I kid you not. In other words, it's about having someone wait on him at some you know, restaurant where they serve some foreign food. That's what he wants it for, someone to wait on him. 811, Bill Colley with you this morning, our top story on News Radio 1310, KLIX, and News Radio 1310.com. So the board members had been invited to the second meeting, which was billed as an informational meeting, and I'm told every elected politician in the area was also elected or also invited. How many ended up showing up? One. And he had been invited to take part in the panel discussion, and he was uh, one of the keynote speakers. Uh, It happened to be Pete Nielsen from Mountain Home, who admitted that he's somewhat of a lone voice in the state legislature on a great many of these issues. But otherwise, I, I, I found I had some of the comments from people in the crowd and the speakers who had signed up to address the later meeting. And I've got to tell you, these people have some impressive resumes and they have some impressive things to say. There was one young woman who must be in her early 20s 
who actually stood and spoke about this program and, and, and really you know, pointed out her family came to the United States as immigrants generations ago, but reflected on the fact that we may not have room. And there was another uh, couple who were there, and the woman got up and she spoke as well, and they had served as missionaries in Myanmar, which used to be known as Burma in Southeast Asia. And she talked about the, the resettlement of many people from that part of the world here over the years and essentially said, once they get here, nobody cares for them. Oh, the, the, the people who read to them get a check. The resettlement program gets a check. But that's really about it. And then after a while, these people are just simply on their own. They don't even know how to open up a bank account. Because where they've come from, a lot of these things are just simply unheard of. When you've been you know, eking out subsistence in a jungle somewhere, and you're dropped here in Twin Falls, Idaho, or one of the surrounding communities, there's nobody here to take care of you. And her point was, so what happens when you bring in a few hundred more and dump them here? Are things going to get any better? Now, I, 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 before we move along, I wanted to share a couple of quick things with you, which I think are related to this. A couple of things I happened to find. I got home last night and didn't get to bed until 1030. I'm usually keyed up after one of these events. For a guy who gets up normally about 330, uh, that's not necessarily the best thing in the world, but uh, I was wide awake and I was looking over some things on the internet. And I came across this link from World Net Daily, author being Patrick J. Buchanan, longtime advocate for controlling immigration into this country. And I'm going to give you a couple of paragraphs. He writes, Monday's Washington Post had a front page story on escalating rash of violent attacks against refugees in Germany, including arson attacks on refugee centers and physical assaults. Buried in the story was an astonishing stat. Germany, which took in 174,000 asylum seekers last year, was on schedule to take in half a million this year. Yet Germany is smaller than Montana. How long, he writes, can a geographically limited and crowded German nation already experiencing ugly racial conflict take in half a million third world people every year without tearing itself apart and changing the character of the nation forever? Do we think the riots and racial wars will stop if more come? Peoples, he writes, of European descent everywhere they live have birth rates below replacement levels, yet most live in the world's most desirable neighborhoods. The great and growing populations of mankind are in the third world. Countless millions are determined to come to the West, legally if they can, illegally if they must, and the more who succeed, the more who come. Either Western nations, he writes, take tough measures to secure their borders or the Western nations will be swamped. He's written a couple of books about this. I, I actually got to write a review, uh, online review. His publisher had me write a review of his book because I, I ordered it and got it in the, uh, got it, uh, the day it came out on release. And I'll tell you what, it was a fascinating read. And so I, I, I sent some comments back via email. And the next thing I know, they said, can we use these as part of the reviews that we're compiling? And I said, sure. Great book. And I would recommend if you get down to your local library, you know, take a look at uh, some of the sections. Uh, usually it's in sociology, not necessarily in history. But if you look, uh, you could even ask about Pat Buchanan, your local librarian, who might be a liberal, might turn up her nose or his nose. But still, they will be able to direct you to the uh, section where you can find his books. Also, I would check out an author by the name of Charles Murray. Very similar writer. I've read a number of his works as well, and I can tell you these men are spot on. They're not politically correct. Political correctness is just to make a lot of liberals feel better about themselves, the limousine liberals, because they think they have too much, and they're, they're, they're guilt-ridden by that. And then I found this at Crisis. William Kilpatrick used to be a professor a history professor at Boston University in Massachusetts, which is considered to be somewhat of a liberal part of the country, but he is a very conservative writer, and he has a piece today about all of this, and he says, as it turned out in the Western world, the flip side of tolerance for diversity was intolerance for one's own culture and the things that made it distinctive. He said, people who are ashamed of their culture do not defend it. He said, our situation in America is not yet as desperate as that in Europe, where they have a steady supply of homegrown terrorists. And he points out, in Europe, every day there is someone being arrested on terrorist charges or actually committing an act of terrorism. Every day. We're getting pretty close to that in this country. He says, on the surface level, these people blend in with the culture. Think about Major Nadal Hassan. The Sarnayev brothers in Boston were sports fans. Mohammed Abdulaziz, the Chattanooga shooter, seemed in many respects to be an all-American boy, but on the outside they appeared to be ordinary, on the inside they were more like the pod people 
an invasion of the body snatchers, aliens with alien ambitions. You're on the air with Bill Colley at 816 on News Radio 1310 KLIX and News Radio 1310.com. What's on your mind? Yeah, good morning, Bill. Well, I was, they had an open forum yesterday afternoon, so I took it, the opportunity to point out that regardless of the successes of the refugee program, these unvetted Syrian Muslims coming in here is a real danger to our community. And I said, Islam itself is entering phase three, which means t- total war against the world and chanting death to America and Israel, burning our flag. They're being very, very open about this. And we're very naive that uh, we are accepting these people. They're unvetted. Uh, two different congressional committees have determined that there's no records. Syria is a failed state. And I pointed all this out to the board. None of this was reported in the local uh, Times News this morning, only about the kumbaya, the, the, the culture, and yes. the good food and stuff. Yes. So it was totally ignored. <laughs> I actually had six minutes and covered most of the topic, including the fact that they're using the refugee center. This is World Net Daily. They've already found a refugee that was a terrorist in coming through the refugee program. So, folks, we have an intimate den- danger of, of these people coming in here. We better wake up and stop the na- naivety of this whole situation. I would agree, and I thank you much, and thank you for being there last night. That uh, He was at both of the meetings, I should point out. It's 818. We've got a break in just about a minute. Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov once said uh, that the world was comprised of a great many useful idiots. He was known to the world by his party name, his Communist Party name of uh, V.I. Lenin. That newspaper is staffed by useful idiots. Let's be honest about that. We're coming up on uh, 820. It's 54. Bill Colley with you this morning on News Radio 1310 KLIX and NewsRadio1310.com. This fellow Kilpatrick closes his piece at crisis today by saying, what happens when the leaders of a society are themselves detached from that society? What happens, for instance, when the leaders of the U.S. government begin to see themselves not as representatives of the American people, but as members of a worldwide order of global elites, a sort of non-religious ummah? In other words, people who are assisting in the, uh, the Muslim conquest of the West. When you've got a president who travels the world saying that your country is not exceptional, all countries think they are exceptional, and constantly bowing and saying, I'm sorry, he doesn't represent you. Let's be honest about that. Even even the, 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 you know, the biggest drooling leftist out there understands that. Of course, they approve of it, but they understand it. Bill Colley with you. Steve Millington will join us in about 15 minutes. He's on the schedule today. Chairman of the Twin Falls County Republican Party, talking a little politics. In fact, I might do some of that too coming up in just a few minutes.